Adam Rifkin called up and said, dude, we're doing a Kiss movie. And I'm like, what? Detroit Rock City. So he basically hired me for the gig on the phone. And then I found out two days later I wasn't doing the movie because the producers thought I was a jazz guy and not a rock <laughs> But I just got off a rock tour. <laughs> Tyler Bates, I love this guy's name because it sounds like a heavyweight boxer or a lead singer of a rock and roll band or even a quarterback in the NFL. Now I'm laughing because we're both super passionate about the NFL and my favorite team, the Indianapolis Colts, and his favorite team, the Tennessee Titans, are rivals in the same division in the AFC conference, which always makes for a good hang at his house when we're watching our teams play each other. All right, so this guy is born in Los Angeles, but he grows up in Chicago, which is a great city for music, right? Now, he plays guitar, and my guess is he always wanted to be a rock star musician and play in a rock and roll band like millions of other kids. This, of course, is not an easy thing to accomplish. Well, Tyler, the cool thing is that he did accomplish his fantasy. He moved back to Los Angeles at age 28, to make a career in music, and he eventually ended up touring with Marilyn Manson and recently Jerry Cantrell from Alice in Chains. But not only did he go on tour with these guys, he co-wrote, played guitar, and produced their records. That's pretty cool. In 2014, Tyler co-wrote and produced Marilyn Manson's record, The Pale Emperor, which debuted at number eight on the Billboard Top 200 Albums chart while the single, Deep Six, went on to chart higher than any other single by Marilyn Manson on Billboard's mainstream rock chart. He also produced Marilyn's Heaven Upside Down and still continues to do music with him today. Now, I'm just getting started (laughs) because Tyler is presently one of the greatest producer and composers for film, television, and video games, and is renowned for his diverse range of scores, spanning genres from action to comedy, and is known for composing and also producing soundtracks for major films like Conan the Barbarian, Guardians of the Galaxy, John Wick franchise, the Halloween remake, Dawn of the Dead, Halloween 1 and 2, Sucker Punch, and 300, which is one of my favorites, Doomsday, The Day the Earth Stood Still, and he scored music for four Rob Zombie films, beginning with 2005's The Devil's Rejects. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Now, Tyler has collaborated with great film directors like Zack Snyder, Neil Marshall, William Friedkin, Scott Derrickson, James Gunn, Chad Stalski, and David Leach. The guy is definitely working 24-7, which, boy, can I relate to that? There is no way someone can work with all these different types of people and completely different personalities, flipping between film, TV, game, and music businesses without being able to totally understand who these people are, get along with them, get them to trust you, and give them what they want, even if they don't know what they want. Tyler's genius is not just the guitar or composing music. It's his ability to create emotional connections with people and enhance the story they are trying to create in music or in film. I love talking to Tyler about anything because he knows how to connect and communicate with you. He is always 100% present and 100% authentic. I love this guy, Tyler Bates. Okay, we're done, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kenny. <laughs> That's just the tip of the iceberg. But it's true, man. It's like, I mean, you know, the hangs we have at your place, it's like, with, with all the stuff you got going on, and I know what it's like to be stupid busy, you always connect, you know, like, you know, maybe we've had 10 drinks, but you always connect, you know, and it's always so cool to talk about whatever, you know? I love that. Let's feel for life, man. I mean, mm. uh, I gain a lot of... Uh, understanding and insight to the stories I'm trying to tell through yeah. film, television, records, whatever it is, just through my personal connections with people. And and I really reserve space for people who I think are authentic in the moment. Um, you've been in my house a lot of times or 
you know, wide variety of people there. Oh, yeah. And it's always a cool, safe environment where it doesn't, you know, I don't tolerate any bullshit. It's not like a networking I like situation, that. you know. I mean, everybody is cool and and uh, relaxed and we always have a good time. So, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I can tell because, you know, you're this nice guy, but, you know, I can tell you don't tolerate bullshit, which means I feel honored that I'm there. That's so cool. And you always have the coolest people. The conversations are incredible. So what I wanted to ask you, because I don't even know the answer to this. So at 28, which is, you know, not young, you go back to L.A. I mean, did you have anything lined up? I mean, anything. No, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm only 38, so it's been pretty rough. But no. <laughs> yeah, like I'm uh, 35. <laughs> no, man. Look, I never, you know, it's interesting because I didn't go to college. There were extenuating yeah. circumstances that that made me decide to stay close to home when I was graduating high school. Yeah. So I actually, through a connection in a, in a metal band I was in, in high school, uh, I got a job in the stock market. And so Ooh. that was the only real job besides, you know, high school jobs and before, um, that I had, you know, and I learned so much about life, uh, through working there. And I, I managed a trading firm by the time I was 19. Was that in Chicago? Yeah. That was board of options exchange. So so at 19, I was trading stocks and options, yeah. and uh, that was very interesting. And the great thing about it was, is I, was, I was mentored by some really amazing men who taught me a lot of uh, yeah. a, a, a lot of how I should handle myself under pressure, a lot about accountability, um, absolutely authenticity, which, I mean, I think that's been more innate in me anyway. Yeah. Um, but that really helped me... Uh, turned my focus to pursuing the next chapter of music when I realized I had outgrown my uh, my aspirations with my Chicago area bands. You know, I wanted to do something more. Um, and it, back then, pre-internet, <laughs> you know, I would I would form a band with, with the best singer I could find, you know, because yeah. if you didn't have a good singer, you're screwed. But, you know, then I was writing for their strengths and not necessarily what was what I was interested in doing. And I felt like I wanted to go deeper in the musical expression, composition, and also the the array of people that I would encounter in my life. You know, it was pretty insular there. Yeah. Great people, great place to yeah. have cut my teeth. But um, I always knew I wanted to come back to LA and that's where my family's from. And uh, so yeah, I, I had made that decision and eventually did come back on June 3rd of uh, 93. And um, I had no jobs, no, nothing lined up. Uh -huh. But the, but the, th the interesting thing is I, I mentioned that I didn't go to college because I've been asked to be a guest speaker at, at some really, you know, uh, elite universities over the years. <laughs> and the first thing I'll tell a master class is uh, if you have a backup plan, you'll use it. <laughs> So I've never had a backup plan. There was never anything else yeah. for me. Now, that said, I'm, I'm always willing to make adjustments or adapt to my environment so that I can thrive as a creative person. And in doing so, I've had to look through life through many lenses and find things that really uh, satisfy me that I didn't even understand existed prior to then, prior to being on that quest. And that's also informed my music is more as a composer, you know, yeah. as a guitar player, it informs the, my taste or the way I express myself. You know, when I was a kid, I was doing guitar clinics and all that stuff. And, you know, there's not, you know, really much use for that type thing. And in, in my current, <laughs> yeah, exactly. my current life, yeah. but you know, it's really, the whole journey is something that I, I own completely, you know, I'm, there are many incriminating photos of my fashion faux pas back in the day and my yeah. fair faucet hair and all that stuff. But, you know, that's the road I came in on, you fair know. Fair faucet hair? You did you? For real. We got to get that. I got to see that. I was, wow. I was once pretty. Yeah. <laughs> well, see, well, any, well, anything with hair with me is fascinating because I, I had a, a, a little window of hair. Yeah, but look how nice, it, it, nicely shaped your head is. Dude, you don't know until you get... You know, when I shaved, it was a funny enough, Chicago band, Smashing Pumpkins. I waited till I was in Europe when I thought, okay, I got a month. It was already this short. I was like shaving at the, the smallest little clip level. And I thought, I can't shave it. I got a bump back here. And I was terrified. As soon as I shaved it, and ironically on that show at the Metro, 
When I did my first show, my son put glasses on me as I walked on stage. I had a black shirt with a yellow stripe. He put yellow goggle glasses. And they talked more about my glasses than my playing in the Chicago Tribune. I went, that was my first introduction to brand. I brand, I was like, okay, I'm wearing glasses, shaved my head, that was it, done. Yeah. Well, I was terrified to cut my hair off. Well, you're lucky, you know, you have good skin. I mean, this is overrated, you know, but I mean, underrated rather, you yeah. know. Um, you know, it doesn't, it's not always the case. So, no, you know, it, you never know what's under the lid, you, you know, so you, you don't. it's working for you. So you come to uh, L.A., did, but did you, um, did you get your first break in the film, TV composition thing or in a rock band? I don't really uh, know what was a break exactly because yeah. everything kept breaking. <laughs> <laughs> I was yeah. so broke. So you were, that was the big thing. You were I was so, broke. so freaking broke. Yeah. So um, when I started getting to know more people out in L.A., I would go to parties and barbecues and people that I would speak to were, you know, some were directing like Corman movies or even more independent films than those movies. And those are we're talking C level movies, not B level. Yeah. Some of them B movies. And you hadn't done any composing like in Chicago for no, movies? No. no. So they, 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 uh, you know, I, I got offers to do movies and I, I told everyone, I'm like, I've never done this. So, um, I, I'm into it. I'll do my best. And it was either that or painting houses, you know, because I, I would do demos for people like for a hundred bucks. I'd, you know, write all the music and record somebody because I needed to eat, you know. Did you paint houses at one point? Oh, yeah. See, I knew it. Yeah. You did. You weren't joking. I did. I painted Nicolas Cage's house twice. Whoa. Look uh, where that got you. He doesn't. I don't even know him. <laughs> 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 but you know what? That's how I found the neighborhood I now live in. I can't even believe it. Like, did I don't live in that neighborhood. He did. <laughs> He did. I couldn't believe it. Like I, I was, I was, I don't even want to say what I got paid, but it wasn't, it wasn't a lot. <laughs> so I remember coming home one day and telling my wife, you know, we were living in an apartment. I'm like, damn, I was painting this house today. That neighborhood is just so awesome. I would love to live there because it feels so good. And yeah, I mean, it's a nice no, place, nice. but it's so, you know, there's just something really uh, natural and calming about it for me. So it's just very strange that uh, years later we wound up there. You know what? I, I don't need to interrupt you, but man, the thing that the thing that, and this is what I love about you, is like, yeah, you're talented and, and all this stuff, but you have this deep insight and wisdom, like to make that decision when you were in Chicago. It wasn't that you just came out of here; it was the why you did it, and you were already this. You, you were gifted with this deep insight and understanding of life in general, which then, you know, helps you <laughs> with everything you do, you know? It's really a gift. I mean, it really is. And I, and I, I am that person that, that likes to go deep. And so I'm, I'm impressed. It's very, it's really cool, man. Well, I was headed into my uh, Saturn return, right? You know, I'm not that deep into astrology, but <laughs> anyway, it was just another thing, you know, another yeah. milestone for me to just make a decision and get my, myself to be somewhere else. I, I knew that if I waited into my thirties, that that would probably uh, diminish my, my chances of, uh, of achieving some version of what I was right. aspiring to. When I moved to LA, I really wanted to write with and produce artists. That, that's really wanted to do what I wanted to do. Of course, every day, every day or two when I brush my teeth No, but every, every morning, you know, when I brush my teeth, it's like, I still see a guitarist. You know, and I've scored over a hundred movies and some bunch of, I mean, it's hard to even fathom it now, but yeah. it's been a long journey. But I uh, met this, this girl, Lisa Papineau, and we ended up forming the band Pet. And that was an interesting um, collaboration. We, we ended up signing a deal with Atlantic Records and got involved with oh, Tori wow. Amos and all this stuff. But um, we, uh, she, she definitely turned me on to different perspectives about art and music that has been very helpful to me over the years. Uh, the band was pretty joyless. We were a really good band, but we were kind of like watching a car wreck or something, you know, it was not always a pleasant experience, you know, <laughs> but on uh, stage, you could, you could witness this. Yeah, well, yes, you could, absolutely could. Um, <laughs> I would have paid for that. <laughs> it was it was an intense ban. I mean, we, it, but I, I am proud of what we did do uh, at the time. A funny thing that was happening is, so I, I was living in that apartment that I mentioned earlier when I was painting houses between my movies, and my band had, Pet had gotten a song on the Crow Two soundtrack, which I think pretty much every band was on that soundtrack. There, there's 17 bands on it, 
And I've since worked with a number of the people yeah. from those bands, which is even more weird. So one day I'm sitting in my, I'm working in my second bedroom studio on, um, on, I, I forget which movie it was. It's probably something that we shouldn't really remember anyway, but I keep hearing the song, like the song from the soundtrack. Now the soundtrack was, had just come out and I wasn't even paying attention to that. And our record had not come out yet. And every time I stop my music, I'm like, what the hell? I keep hearing my band. I'm like, this is the craziest thing. So, so I go out downstairs, go out the back and I hear it coming out of a house behind my apartment. I didn't know who lived there. So I figured, okay, I got a promo copy of my album. I'm going to walk around the corner of the street and I'm going to give it to whoever's playing the music. Cause I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah. So I knock on the door and this kid's like 14 years old. He answers the door. He says, I'm sorry, is the music too loud? And I'm like, no, but you keep playing my band over and over and over <laughs> again, like for an hour, right? So I gave him the promo copy of our album and he just looked at me and he's just like, this is the coolest thing that's ever happened. Yeah, right. <laughs> and you know, it's kind of interesting. I, I probably have, you know, hundreds of stories like that, that where I'm in that position. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's yeah. interesting the people, I mean, look, we're sitting here, you yeah. know, um, it, it, my life is is kind of a, a very interesting uh, amalgam of of one experience leads to the next, and this relationship ends up complementing the other one. I mean, the, um, I think we'd need to be talking for about fifty hours for me to give you like the real details oh, on, on how yeah. how you know each decade went. But uh, it's been with every success, there's been a steep stumble. Like my first few studio movies, like oh man, I got to. $50 million Stallone movie. It opens at $6.8 million. And it's like, okay, now I've got that on my resume and I have to overcome that yeah. and get another studio movie. Yeah. And I remember uh, that happened again on what's the worst that could happen. I'm thinking, well, don't name your movie. Don't name your movie happen. that. <laughs> <laughs> Talk so, about putting it out in the universe. <laughs> so, so anyway, before I knew it, like I did 18 movies without ever meeting another composer, anyone who'd ever done a film. So I was learning from directors and producers, editors, music Whoa. editors, re-recording mixers. I was trying to learn as much about their process as possible yeah. so that I could help facilitate what they needed for their film and the whole writing aspect of it didn't really kick in for a while. I, I think my 15th movie was a bebop score that Blue Note put out. And that's when I thought, I could do this. I could do Wait that. a minute, what were you doing if you weren't writing? Uh, what were you doing with those, or those first movies? I mean, I was scoring them. Right. But I was also trying to understand what the true purpose of the composer was. Oh, the true function. The true function. In the process. Right. Right. So if I don't know everything about what yeah the writing processes i yeah. certainly want to know what the beats of post-production are you know how to anticipate yeah. what the director is the looking for and when. yeah and so that really helped me uh conceptualize things a little bit more successfully understanding the time and budgetary constraints and figuring out how i can realize a complete concept within the construct of that right so that took a while. So, um, yeah, like I said, I met another, it, did. Yeah. it was 18 movies and I met another composer finally. And, um, it was my 33rd film. Dawn of the dead was my first number one movie. So that changed things a little bit. That makes sense. You don't just walk and you wouldn't want to have a number one after your first attempt. Cause now what do you do? You know, yeah. you, you're not, you know, you're at, well, you see, once again, you were asking the right questions. I still like them. <laughs> <laughs> I still like them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, hey, when when I did I played on my first number one single, Jack and Diane, I was I celebrated for two seconds and I was like mortified that like it's like a running back. I scored a touchdown. Well, I gotta do it again to prove that I really can do this. When am I gonna get the ball again? Oh my god, they're not even using me. I'm not even in the game, you know, you know, that kind of thing. And then I break my leg. Gotta mm -hmm. wait for the next year. I was mortified. I went, I got to wait for John to write the song. And then I got to come up with a hit, a killer drum part to make it a number one hit single. He's not going to write for another two. You, you know, you just, we but, weren't satisfied with just, right. like, hey, I've done it. You can't set it and forget it. No, it's even now, I think I, I'm even, I think I'm more angsty and more driven than ever. Yeah, me because too. Because I have a lot to, I have a lot that I want to do in my life. And I know this game's half played or more. So, yeah, uh, I'm not wasting time, you yeah. know, but I try and have Thanks fun. Thanks for being here. <laughs> yeah, man. No, I, I try and have a good time, Kenny. You know, that's, that's, yeah. you know, you never know how many summers you have on this earth, whether you're young or whether you're old. It does, it, 
Yeah. It almost doesn't matter. You can never take anything for granted. So it's important to really have the intent with every one of your yeah. days to have a good experience in that day, to try and be kind to people, to try and experience at least a moment of joy, at least a moment of learning that you're aware of. You know, these things will make you a stronger person if you're if you have yeah. the intent to do that each day. Totally agree. I was thinking that the other night when we were at your place and it was that moment when I was sitting at the fire pit and it was only, it was only a few of us left and I was looking around, I was looking at you and I was like, God, I, mean, I know Tyler's got a million things he should be doing up there, but you would definitely totally live in the moment in your house with great people around you, having great laughs and that, you're right. It made me aware of it, made me think, yeah, this, it's really good to be doing stuff like this. You know, because we could work 24 seven and never do any of that. Even if it seems abstract, hanging out, having some laughs or having a, a conversation about something that's really a matter of the heart or something very, you know, very personal is also going to inform who you are as an artist, who you are as a musician. Mm -hmm. It's going to inform the spirit that you continue to forge ahead with every day. So. You know, we can work and work and work, but at some point you're just digging a hole in the ground if you don't have a point to it. Yeah. You know, there of course there are the obvious rewards of of your labor, but you you you're going to have a unique experience in life if you take the time to really in, in, imbue your work with experience with people that you love and the yeah. people you you trust. And you know, in life we trust people, and sometimes we get burned. And that's how we grow. We learn, you know, yep, um, totally agree. I, I've chosen my life and I'm not saying I'm impervious to being upset. because I certainly have been, yeah. but you know, when things don't work out, you say I got screwed or whatever. If you're going to leave it at that and you're not going to take away some wisdom that will help guide you through the next chapter of your life. Looks like we have a friend. There's here. a fly. I got uh, two of them. There's a third one here. Uh, I showered too. It's crazy. <laughs> Um, but, <laughs> but so anyway, I mean, to me that, that keeps me from ever being bitter. Yeah. Not, I, I, like I said, you know, I'm not immune to just being human and sometimes being, you know, a little feisty about this and that, but honestly, I want to see people do well. Um, I'm focused on my own stuff. I'm not looking for anybody to come take care of it for me. Right. And, and because I accept that responsibility, I don't bring desperation into the room with me. And that's probably what's led to me working with so many successful people and it also keeps my head clear so i can understand people like i, I don't judge people that's why you work with i mean you're working with so many different personalities in the film business tv business and then you know obviously you're working with amazing gifted musicians like a marilyn manson and that's where your gift of how understanding people and how to kind of you know, being humble enough, not not backing down because you're not going to take shit, but you know how to work with them and to help them be get the best that they can be get. And that's why you keep getting called. It's this people skill thing that you're talking about. That's my point. It's this people skill. It's this ability to connect and communicate where people feel safe and they like you and they will, yeah, I'm, who do you want to be in the room with? That guy? Who do you want to work on your most personal stuff and I need help? That guy, you know what I mean? It does tie in together. Everything you said works and it's not just being talented. Well, you want to empower the people around you yeah, and not take ownership for their personal success. A lot of people like to do that. Yeah, that's big. You know what I mean? You yeah, it's... Let people enjoy their successes on their own, even if it's between the two of us in the room. Yeah. I don't have to say hey, I, anything hey. to infringe on on the power that comes with that. Because what my my primary goal in the studios is to empower the people around me. I don't need to say anything to talk about myself or tell my story. It's it's whatever. I I I've got myself to yeah to deal with, you know, and I'm, I'm never going to be totally satisfied with anything. Yeah. But what I do like, what I really love is when I see somebody getting past the, the real doubt that they start with Manson, for sure. When I met him and mind you, I did that pale emperor with him moonlighting while I was scoring guardians of the galaxy one. Wow. What a contrast. The, yeah. Yeah. That's the juxtaposition, juxtaposition of worlds. Uh, wow. Yeah, it was diametrically opposed, but actually not. 
because in both instances, there is like this sense of wonderment. What if we can do this? I mean, you know, obviously Marilyn Manson is a complex character, but of if you know him the way I do, I've, I've experienced a ton of, ton of laughs, ton of joy with this guy and a lot of creative achievements that we both shared together that have been some of the greatest moments of my life. And also a lot of that work has led to other people wanting to work with me. Yeah, of course. And I'm grateful for that. Yeah. I mean, the weirdest things have happened as a result uh, of that work. And, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy, that director, uh, the movie we did before that, was super it earned three hundred and twenty two thousand dollars worldwide wow then guardians of the galaxy and it made i don't know close to a billion or something so you never know what's around the corner so it's really about your connection to people and if you if you feel there's an intrinsic aspect to to the relationship and i don't mean yeah is this a horse that i can bet on it's like is there an energy there that seems like it's it's important to continue to cultivate in your life I don't think so much about the, uh, we need a number one record. We need a hit single. Like this movie's got to be a number one. I'm trying just to do great work. Right. And uh, sometimes I come up short of my aspirations, but I've always, you know, very altruistic, you know, I'm a total nerd when it comes to making music and stuff. I love it. Yeah. You know, and there's no reason why you shouldn't just freaking get excited about it. I don't have any hobbies. Well, dude, that's, you know? that's what makes you keep doing what you're doing. It's like, you know, everything is about purpose and bliss and your truth and your passion and your deepest desires, whatever you want to call it. If you're operating from that place, you're going to be unstoppable. You won't even be able to stop yourself. I always say to people, <laughs> I'm the guy who can't wait to wake up in the morning to do what I'm going to do. And I'm also the guy who doesn't want to turn the lights off at night because I'm still digging what I'm doing. You know, I got to make myself, you know, <laughs> I'll call, I'll be tech calling you up be like, Hey, it's one thirty. I'm on my way home. Are you still up? Yeah, but you know, I think I I gotta slow down. I'm, and then other times, you know, like come on over. You know, a house does not build itself, Kenny. So yeah. I have been yeah. extremely fortunate to have my wife Lisa with me and through all of it, and she yeah. she just accepts me <laughs> and encourages me. Like I was not gonna ever go out on tour with Manson. I wasn't even thinking about it. Wow. I wasn't just not so even. She encouraged you. Yeah, That's we were. Awesome. We finished the record. I put his band together for him, and he kept asking me, "Is this you're going to come out and tour?" My, I just look at him. He says, "What? You're too busy." I'm like, "I'm kind of busy, man." <laughs> and then I, you know, I, Lisa knew that he kept asking me, and she's like, "Why don't you go play? You wrote this music with this guy. Go have what fun. A That's cool what you thing do." For her to say. She's like, "That's what you do." A lot of women go like, "Hey, man, you ain't going on the road. You got to no. stick around here." We don't. We don't live that. That type of life that is so cool man and that opened up a, a yeah. i oh, mean yeah. i played my first arena at 48 years old yeah. man <laughs> that's, I love I it. Mean, that's crazy that's crazy so that's like a seriously interesting idea like if you really show up for your life yeah yeah, yeah forever yeah. yeah you just don't know what is possible well you yeah. could have easily not ever had that experience you could have like said nope but you were open to it and it helped to have lisa you know add a little you know, that's the other part of, you know, she's a part of you. And so she just, if you weren't really going to do it, you wouldn't have done it. But she, that encouragement did help. And I did play like a thousand shows before that, though. So, yeah, it helped. Yeah. However. Yeah. However, <laughs> you could have easily stayed. That brings me up. And what do, you, what do you prefer? Do you prefer being locked into the, uh, you know, the studio composing, working by yourself or collaborating or being on the road? You need to have that mixture of both. I love it all. Um, again, the altruism kicks in like uh, over this past you know year and a half um, after working with Jerry Cantrell, who's my good friend and neighbor. <laughs> we become great friends over the past decade, and um, well, he's a cool dude, that's for sure. Yeah, so we got together to make his last record, Brighton, which uh, we're both extremely proud of the work. It's it's amazing, and he just really I think raised the bar for himself on that album. But I put his band together for him. And it was a big commitment for me to go out on the road and play adjacent to the guitar legend. I've never been the second guitarist ever, ever in my life. I've always been the lead guitarist. Well, at least you wrote some of these parts, so you were playing your parts. We did a song that that we had written together for John Wick, which is cool, John Wick 2. But, you know, Jerry is such a masterful artist um, that it was a great learning experience. And also the the 
experience for everyone in the band. Not everyone is like just a gigging, touring musician. Yeah. So it was new for some people. And, um, you know, it was unfortunate at the time that uh, our keyboardist, Roger Manning, couldn't come to Europe with us. Oh, well, I know Roger, yeah. Yeah, Roger, yeah, Roger was busy with some things and Jerry was kind of, you know, he, he was a little stressed about it. He was like, what are we going to do, yeah, man? Because Roger's unique and special. So he had asked my daughter Lola to be the opening act on the first leg of that tour. Yeah. And, um, and so he and I were at the airport and uh, uh, what happened was, yeah, like some of the band got COVID and we we're like, all right, we're out of here. We're going back to LA till everybody's healthy. <laughs> so we did. And, um, and so he's, he's asking me like, who are we going to get to play keyboards? Like, I, I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know people like that. I'm like, I just got to find somebody, a dude yeah. who does what Lola does, you know, cause she plays every instrument. She's a great singer. Yeah. And well, and you're in LA, which helps. So he's like, well, what about Lola? I'm like, she's 20, dude. <laughs> he's like, He's like, well, would you ask her? Like, if, oh if she's open to it, then I'll call her. I don't want to pressure her. And I'm like, all to right. To replace Roger Manning, Lolo, replace That's heavy. And you know what's what's really cool? Roger did provide some mentorship to Lola when she was younger. I mean, yeah. she's a classically trained pianist, yeah. so she's definitely on it. On tour with your daughter. How cool so, is that? So, yeah. Uh, wow. We did a whole European tour together, and then uh, we did one this year as well. So that was a really amazing experience and some of my very closest friends were in the band and and it was really amazing musically and personally it was awesome what what is you know jerry Cantrell? what is the thing that makes him different you know I mean, there's a million guitarists out there what is the thing that this if you could you know say what's unique about his thing how does he look at things that's so special mm -hmm. well first off he's an extremely soulful person mm -hmm. you that's, know and and he i think he uh I mean, he's come from some, you know, like most of us through some heavy experiences. Yeah. And, and I think he is taking the best of those experiences to inform his work. Now, mind you, before everything manifested when he was a kid, he wrote Man in the Box and all these incredible yeah. songs. I mean, he's a gifted person. There's just a, there is a radio frequency that was reserved for him and he found it. That's a good way of putting it. And I think that in his guitar playing, He's never been in competition with anybody. He's just always, he's, yeah. he's like, look, I could have gone either the fast route yeah. or this other route, which is just vibe and just my style. And he just knew that that was the way for him. And when he plays, you know, it's him. Uh, when you hear his songs, you know, you know, it's him. Yep. And that's, if you have a unique signature, that's more important than oh, any yeah. technical achievement you can make. Oh, yeah. it, it certainly is a rock or pop. That's a hard thing to do, to be recognized as soon as you start playing. Yeah. I mean, but what's interesting is I, I really did not think about this until pretty recently, actually. I look back over my career because I was being interviewed and someone had prefaced uh, the interview with some questions and it really made me think about a lot of the experiences I've had and I realized I've worked with so many geniuses that I'm like what the hell am I doing in that room <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> you know it's oh, so dude. crazy and and all of them yeah you know even like you see somebody like Marilyn Manson that guy is brilliant um He's brilliant. And as an artist, I think he's a very important one. You know, um, uh, we've, we've been through a lot, Yeah. you know, uh, I've been in and out of, of working with him or performing with him, but still always maintained my, my appreciation for everything we did together and my friendship for him. And, uh, there are times when he'll write something more recently cause he's extremely clear, yeah. uh, these days. But uh, I'm like, man, read those lyrics back. Mm -hmm. Amazing stuff. And what it does is it inspires me to do something better. And those are the people I want to be around. Huh. People who are constantly trying to improve. And that's, the, that's where he's at these days, is constantly trying to be his absolute best. And I look in my life and I'm sitting here with you. You're that person too. You know, and, and the people who work with me in my studio, they're that person yeah. too. You know, they're trying to be better than they were yeah, yesterday. Why, that's what, why wouldn't you want to be around them? It's someone that's going to give as much as you're going to give to it. You know, you don't want to be dragging everybody through the mud, you know? You know, there's a certain velocity, though, you know, you operate at. And you need to yeah. align yourself with people who can handle that.
What is your day like these days? What's a day like for Tyler? I mean, it must change, but give me some sort of idea what it's like for Tyler Bates. What time do <laughs> you wake up? Is there any regularity? You just go with, you know. There's more structure. I mean, I've always been rel- very disciplined, but there's more structure to my day now. Um, it helps me keep things straight. And also, I know that I need to get proper sleep because I wasn't sleeping very well. What's proper lot. sleep? How many hours? Six and a half. Do you do it straight? Uh, as opposed to... Well, I mean, I'm like three, then one, then two, know? then one, then 30 seconds or 30 minutes. And, you know, it's just never right. straight. This is interesting. So I've had real problems. Um, and, you know, taking sleep aids and whatever. And one time I, I was on tour with Manson, and I ran out of them. And then he... <laughs> it's kind of I can't, ironic. I cannot wait to see what comes next. Because back in the and back at that time, it was probably 2017 or something. Okay. It was like a, I mean, yeah. pretty much if you needed something, yeah. you could find it. But yeah. not not at the time that I ran out of my sleep medication. I we played in two countries, two concerts, then flew to England. Waited there for a day uh, and then got on a 11 hour flight back here. Uh, I was awake for 96 hours because I was just not able to calm my mind, knowing that I was coming home to a lot of right. work stuff, a lot, right. just a lot had happened. And I knew it's like, okay, I just shortened my life, you know, in this particular episode. So I've been very, uh, very focused on dealing with this so that i can just clean that part of my life up and you know this stems from our childhood you know oh, of course everything um, does, yeah. you know whether you were told you're going to be a loser or yeah. whatever it is you know yeah. so i've been working on it and i learned that uh, everybody has two sleep cycles every night so if you wake up at three in the morning don't look at the clock and get pissed everybody wakes up twice a night whether you remember it or not mm. so what i've started to do is to reserve that six and a half hours of sleep for myself. So if I go to bed at one in the morning or something, yes. then I will set my alarm for 7.30. Even if I wake up, I'll wake up before it. Yeah. But by setting the alarm, I've never set alarms before, but by doing that, it basically tells my brain, don't worry about it. It's covered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. one less thing for your brain to yeah. be worried about while you're sleeping. Yeah. And when you reduce all those things that heighten your activation, which is that energy that, 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 keeps you awake like your sleep drive is what makes you want to go to sleep your body is tired it wants to go to sleep but if the activation all that nervous energy or the overthinking that goes on is is, in six cups of coffee well you got to watch that too you know i don't do it in the afternoon i now have to read actual pages of a book i can't do it on a kindle or on my phone or anything like that because Uh, even with the blue you know the blue blue blocking glasses it's still not good so your brain will stop it won't produce the melatonin it normally does the hour before you go to sleep. Yeah. If you don't give your eyes a well, rest. The, so the book business is going to love you. Well, I mean, the, get back to the paper. Paper. If you're going to, if you're going to cut up some trees, make it worth something. Right, so you, you get know. six and a half hours of sleep when, and, and then seven. The best case scenario. I like that's then what, what now, how does the day start? So I get up 30 push ups. you know, no, no. <laughs> These guns are water guns, 80. bro. I can do eighty. I can do row. eight. I can do at least eight. I promise. You know what? You're you're the average. I think the average might be five. So you're above average. No, I think I could do it. I'm I obsessed, you, though. You know. No, I think I could do a lot, but regardless of appearances. But um, <laughs> I'm very disciplined. I usually don't like eat breakfast. I'll just make a iced coffee in the morning mm-hmm. and brew it. Make iced coffee. Um, I find that it's a little bit better for me. Yeah. And then I just get going in my studio. Now, at the beginning of a day, depending what my deadline schedule is, because every day is an hourglass that turns over. There's always a deadline of some sort, yeah. some type of milestone. If, if I'm really ensconced in television, those shows turn around typically in about four days, 32 minutes of music. By the way, it's a lot. Are you organized the night before? You know what you're going to do when you wake up or do you do it when you wake up? Do you- I do it when I wake up. I mean, I've been doing this so long. I don't want to. Again, I don't want to engage in overthinking. Right. I know how long it takes me to get certain tasks done. And the key is, is to really focus your mind and your energy. You can sit at your desk or do whatever you want to do for eight hours and come up with nothing because you don't focus the right way. You're definitely an A to Z guy. In other words, you know how to get from A to Z, period. At this point in your life, you know how to go from A to Z. This is what you have to do. To get the ADZ, I know what to do to get there. 
Well, you have to, otherwise you you're won't. out. You're out? <laughs> <laughs> otherwise you're out. You're going. Like yeah, there, yeah, yeah. you know, there is no horseshoes in film scoring. Yeah. It's like, you gotta, you gotta no deliver. No excuses. You have to you deliver. deliver. There's, there's only one way, that way. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, you have to approach everything the same way. Live performance. Don't, I mean, there's so many things we can avoid that, that lessen the, uh, the chances of us putting on our best performance. Yeah. Just, just get out of your own way most of the time <laughs> and you have a shot. Exactly. But, you know, I think built in most people is this sense of self-sabotage. It's kind of like a fear of success, yeah. even with successful people. Yeah. And they'll do things yeah. to kind of make their life a little bit more difficult because they're certainly not comfortable with succeeding. And I don't know who is completely comfortable besides yeah. Tom Brady, but yeah. uh, Mahomes maybe. Yeah, I think he's got it too. You know, <laughs> I mean, I want some of what uh, whatever they they have. I like to have. I remember my teacher when I was studying classical music. You know, he say, and I didn't understand what he was saying. I was nineteen. He go, "Are you afraid of success?" I, it stayed with me. Obviously, a part of me understood. The child in me didn't know what he was talking about. He was seeing something that I wasn't aware of. But it, it, but it res the, the the older person in me understood something, and I kept it in my brain until I understood what that meant. And yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of things that we uh, learn as children, and unless you make a conscious effort to say, mm, "I'm never gonna forget," I'm never gonna get rid of that feeling, but I'm gonna instead of staying there every time that feeling comes, I am making a decision. I'm gonna do this now. You actually make a decision. Actually, this becomes a wonderful trigger to do the new way. Mm -hmm. But if you don't make that decision, you like you said, you'll be stuck eight hours in a desk and you'll wonder, why didn't I get anything done? Well, I can tell you, I don't need to say it now, but it's because you didn't get out of the way of yourself. If you want to get this done, you got to go from A to Z. Now just do it. And then you learn what it is. And then you just, that's your day every day. And you can apply that to your friendships. Yeah, your yeah. intimate relationships. Yeah. I mean, it, it applies to everything in your life. I try and have a consistent code, and we all we all come up short sometimes of what we expect of ourselves. But being aware of that is what what adds fuel to the fire to come back and and yeah. do better the next day, and try not to kill yourself over it. So long as you're aware of where you can, you know, make some improvements and maybe be a little bit cooler about how you handled yourself in a situation or a little more understanding of somebody who was trying to express themselves and you, you know, maybe weren't present or whatever. Yeah. So, I mean, those things are, are really important to pay attention to. Again, you know, my job as a composer is to really understand somebody, not to judge them. I'm trying to understand them so that when I am working late at night and I'm trying to, you know, conceptualize an idea or take a risk or something, I have some idea of their sensibilities. So if I'm going to take a risk. Would this work within the spectrum of their sensibilities? Because at the end of the day, I'm making this score and the people who work with me who help me as well. But the director has to identify with it. They have to own it. It's like when you're writing songs with artists, I might come up with some killer riff or something, but if it is not personally appropriate for somebody, it does no one any good. This got to be tricky when you're working all by yourself and you got to think that way because you could be just wasting time. Got to channel people. Yeah. And that's, that's. So what's easier for you? I guess it probably varies, but working alone like that, trying to work for that particular producer or director or opposed to, you know, collaborating with somebody or it just depends on who you're working with. It I mean, just, yeah. it depends. Yeah. Um, but I generally enjoy, uh, with songwriting, I, I enjoy the collaboration with great singers, songwriters, one-on-one. Um, -on -one. This is for movies and TV, right? Uh, just for records. Oh, for records, of course. Yeah. And, well, that, and, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Um, movies have become, okay, so this is an interesting thing, too, is, is, you know, you have to adapt to your environment. Yep. And the process of filmmaking is so different nowadays than it was when i began in wow. in the 1990s roughly well, uh, why technology or just... yeah technology and because of that technology it's changed the way people interact and interject in the process mm. and scheduling and the way budgets mm. are appropriated so for instance as visual effects we're starting to really develop you know matrix was like a huge leap you know obviously 
uh, when we were working on 300 for months and months, all the picture I had were the Spartans and a dirt floor and like, like a green screen background took forever till we got like oil painting backgrounds. It just, it took a long time to, to see this stuff developed. Then really just after that, I saw, you know, movies I started working on were pre visiting everything before they filmed them. So they would have a really concise idea of how they wanted to shoot action sequences. And, and I would start scoring them uh, for James Gunn. I did that for a while, but you know, it was like scoring three movies each time. And it's like, I, I couldn't, you know, I just can't do that all the time. You know, I will if I can, but well, I you can't. only have a, a certain budget. Yeah, you, no, like one, no one pays for that. <laughs> so you know what I'm saying? It's like you give this is the budget, whatever it takes to get to the end, right? Yeah, and it's not like that's scary. And it's not like the actors are hanging out with people uh, when they're at the script phase, yeah. just hanging out and reading lines all day long. What happens if like you you're doing one of these projects and they go, yeah, we don't like those keyboard strings? Would you go to London and get the London Symphony Orchestra and go into Abbey Road, <laughs> and that's included in your budget, right? It is. It's your budget most of the time, yeah. And they and they can demand that you do that, right? Every time there's a change made, uh, a request, it's a check written out of your checkbook that's how it is for composers yeah, now we something. don't have a guild or a union music editors who typically work for composers sort of as the gatekeepers of yeah. the score and songs they have a guild so <laughs> so they get their special payments and you know if they go a minute over 7 p.m it's overtime and yeah. all, you know, all that stuff and someone's get, writing it down so when they're editing all week long friday night you know like four or five in the afternoon you'll get an email yeah we're sending over new reels for the movie you know we need these uh these adjustments made for the screening monday night you know have a nice weekend it's like what weekend <laughs> you know and you know it's you can you can't come over now <laughs> I still figure a way to yeah. to be alive, you know. That's incredible. Uh, yeah. But, you know, again, I'm so uh, privileged to have earned a way into yeah. the business where my name is on shorter yeah. lists, you know, and I'm I'm working all the time. How do you do any of this stuff if you're on tour with Jerry and Jokes or Marilyn Manson? Because I know, you know, it's not like you're full on in these worlds. So how do you do? I mean, how do you do it when you're on the road? Well, I have a travel rig, which is not optimal, um, yeah. but you know, I've gotten, I've grown more accustomed to using it, um, greater depth yeah. now, you know, I used to, I, I used to not find a way to really apply my, the same self that I would in my home, my studios at home, right. you know, um, and I am fortunate to have, you know, my, uh, associates who work with me in my studio right who at this point are pretty bluetooth with me you know they they totally understand what's going on what the objective yeah. is yeah. what the you style can delegate, is you can delegate now yeah i mean i people pay me to be there and to be writing and that's what i do mm. but there are some things that i no longer do that shore up time i don't install software typically <laughs> um i, wouldn't think so. I don't deliver the music anymore i i have someone who prints it all and delivers it yeah um, I check mixes. I don't mix my right. scores it's anymore. So time I mean, we build it as some writing, you know, because so much of it is practical audio, whether it's voices or it's uh, keyboards or guitar performances, things like that. But at the end of the day, I just don't have the time. I'm still writing and I'm sending stuff before I'm done writing to a mixer to right. get it into shape so that once we record the orchestra we can edit it and slam it in and deliver it yeah. it's all in motion everything's in motion it's all like indiana jones sliding right under that gate Great analogy. all the time and it doesn't matter if you had two years to score a movie the last yeah. two weeks are going to be insane Same, yeah you know um it's it's definitely is uh it's like when water circles the drain in the shower <laughs> you know <laughs> what i last. mean no matter what so um it's it can be exciting as much as it can be a little daunting and irritating at times, you know, but it's really cool to see when we all pull together and, and end up with a really successful end result. Can you sleep on a tour bus? No. Yeah. Jerry doesn't either. At so, all? Not well. I mean. So when you get to the hotel, do you guys do sound checks every day? Yeah, we we go to the hotel and then we we go to so sound check. So you get your sleep. Yeah. So you go to bed at seven, eight nine in the morning and you're out of there by two thirty or three so yeah. it's funny when we we're in europe there are many times when it'd just be he and i just sitting at the bus looking out the window we're pulling into zurich or somewhere <laughs> really beautiful as the sun's rising and 
being exhausted, but yeah. just not being able to sleep. But I think next time around, if there is one, I'll be able to sleep because I'm mm. I'm fixing it. You know, give me the secrets. I will. I sleep on the bus, but it's like you know, it's like I said, hour, two hours. Yeah. Wake up, you know, and you know, it's just it, it's not glamorous. It's not glamorous, man. But it beats a van by a mile. <laughs> yeah. I've done well, that. I was, I was just I did an East Coast run with Joe Satriani and they gave us the most comfortable van to go from uh Atlantic City to Jones Beach. And I'm in the back on that rear axle that has no shocks. Oh. <laughs> it, it literally I started laughing. Because I, I literally, it was like getting ridiculous, but it wasn't funny, but I was laughing. No, so, you're still in there for hours. Dude, for hours, getting thrown in the air. And I'm like, ah, what's that line? I'm too old for this. That's that line. That was horrible. But you were doing it, so. I, yeah. I guess you're not. Yeah. And it's Jones Beach and, you know. Well, that's a classic venue, man. It's, it's a greatest. big cement and monolith on the yeah. water. You never know when that hurricane's going to bowl in. It's usually when you're on stage. Yeah. It's guaranteed. Jones Beach, just stick around. The weather's going to change. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've had so many interesting experiences uh, performing live. And it's what's fascinating is if you asked me when I was 40 if I was going to yeah. do that, I'd yeah. I'm like, nah, I guess that's not going to be part of the plan. But there have been some really incredible experiences in my life that I've taken back into the studio and applied to either songwriting or movies. And see, that's one thing I really recognized is at right. it, some point, because I always grew up playing music, performing, that movies were never going to be a vehicle that I could satisfy that or satiate that interest or desire. So it was only once I decided to go out and play with Manson that I realized, okay, this takes some pressure off of that yeah. other thing that I love to do. Because you're out there. You're, you're out there. Exactly. So I'm not trying to to force feed things into a movie because I'm lacking this other aspect of my life that I that I wish to experience. So um, hopefully I'll I'll do something cool uh, again on the road. But uh, I am going to Spain to play a couple shows uh, next week. With who? With myself. <laughs> and an orchestra and a choir. Oh, <laughs> Is this like a Hans Zimmer moment where you're playing songs you've composed? It's the scores you... for a bunch of movies. Um, yeah, scores. Two nights. So it, you could but that. it's part of a film music festival. It's just a, a good excuse do that, to man. do to... the Hans Zimmer thing. You know how he does all his big pieces with a big production. It's Have you seen that? I haven't seen it, but no. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm, yeah. bu I'm busy like doing my, my yeah. own thing. I really, you know what? I'm really bad about following anything on social media. I stay away from it. Yeah. Um, I'm really boring on Instagram. I realized I, I, uh, have made 80 posts on Instagram. Oh, is Instagram like punishing you and like sending you messages? No, 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 I don't look at it enough to know, but actually it was James Gunn who opened my Instagram in 2009. Oh, he He's like, you need an Instagram. I'm like, what's Instagram? <laughs> <laughs> so Candygram. I, so I've done 80 posts, uh, and those are usually just reposts of whatever studio will yeah, yeah. ask me to post. But I, I really think that um, it's best for me just to kind of be a little you bit in my own you world. You don't need it. You don't need it. I mean, some people, I mean, this generation, that's, that's their whole, that's their business. You know, to get followers and make yeah. money that way. Well, that's, that's a, a whole that's other a whole other strange thing. thing yeah. Followers. What's the big difference? Like you know, working, collaborating, doing a Marilyn Manson, Jerry Control record, though that those type of people, and then dealing with the directors. I mean, it's there's similarities, but it's different, right? It's got to be a big difference because well, with the recording artists that I work with, it's generally the buck stops there. We in the room determine what yeah. we like. And right, right there. And that's going to be it. Together. Yeah. That's generally going to be it. Uh, I, we ha I've never received revision notes, you know, other than our own, because, you know, well, yeah. I'm constantly trying to revise and make things better, you know. But with movies, you know, directors have their idea of what they want to do. And oftentimes they're, they're philosophically aligned with the studio and the producers involved. But there are focus groups test audiences you know so there's data that comes back from the the test audience then the focus groups are like a group of 20 people that they really uh harvest quite a bit of opinion and 
and information from, and the studios can be very reactionary to those people. Um, so regardless of what a director intends to do, they will have to contend with those opinions, those notes that are, yeah. that are powered by, you know, they're backed by the studio producers. And I understand, you know, a lot of these movies are big films, even $30 million is a lot of mo money to put up for a movie, but you know, some of them are $200 million. When you're working on a $200 million movie, you're working on not a personal thing. You're working on everything. You know, it's a thing for everyone. Um, yeah. It's not niche. So you have to have the mentality that regardless of how passionate and focused your vision is for what you intend to make, you, you can't, you'd be foolish not to anticipate the input that you need to process and apply to what you're doing. Yeah. Not all of it's going to be not all of it's going to work. It's not all going to manifest, but if somebody has an idea that was, there's no harm in a good idea. You know what I mean? So you may as well What's check that? it out. Everybody right. wins. Yeah. I'm yeah. perfectly well, happy to hear ideas if someone has a good one. And, you know, sometimes people just need to be heard. And I learned that too in, in movies, like, so, you know, I'll have like a preliminary meeting when I'm being hired or they're considering hiring me. So there might be two producers, a director, maybe someone else that will come into my studio and we'll have a conversation. And I can tell who knows music more on a granular level than other people. Yeah. But when someone says something to me right then and there, I'll play to them. They'll say something and I'll pick up an instrument and I'll play back to them and say something like this. What do you think? Now they become part of the process. So it's their score too, because it is their score. Yeah, They're yeah, paying for it. Yeah. It's their movie. I mean, I'm just hired to do my job during that finite amount of time. They may have spent years and years developing it. So I respect yeah. uh, the investment of time and resources that they put into it to afford me the opportunity to do something for them uh, that isn't painting a house. So, um, you know, I keep that right here so that I never grow complacent, you know? It's like when you're co-writing the producer of a record, you're the, the like the producer of the film. But when you're writing for the, you're like a hired gun to do a job and you just do your job. They're two different things, really. Yeah. And if you want no input, then go make your own yeah, record. Yeah, yeah. You know, do whatever you, know, you when, want. When I was young, you know, I just loved every kind of music. Obviously, I made my name playing with John Mellencamp, so I was known as the rock guy. But, you know, I just always loved, I remember being in college and, uh, people found out I played jazz, so the jazzers wanted me to play, you know, play bebop so they could practice their changes. Hours and hours. And they were going, what are you doing that classical shit for? And then the classical people would be going like, God, what are you doing up there I'm like, playing with those dudes? And then both of them gave me shit for playing rock and roll and country music or funk or whatever. I, I was just having fun. So my bottom line is that was true to my heart. And as I now know as an adult, you follow your heart and you keep, keep continue pursue being what you really are you get so much fulfillment and i got good in many styles of music so that i could be then eventually i became a session guy and didn't understand all of a sudden i was getting hired to do not just rock stuff you know i was doing, doing the highwaymen johnny cash went and also chris was talking when the jenks then all of a sudden it was bb king and I remember it was you know then the, the, the uh, it was uh elton john one week was like bb king bonnie Raitt. One day, two days, Elton John, four days, Bob Seger, then the Indigo Girls in Atlanta, which is completely They never had a drummer on their album. And then back to L.A., Willie Nelson, four more days with Bob Seger, and then two weeks with Bon Jovi. And then, you know, next thing you know, I'm doing a special, like I'm playing with Ray Charles. My point is, I love that. That's like, we, But you're that guy. You keep movies. an open mind, yeah. Because you're doing John Wick, which is not the same music as Guardians. No, it's, it's not the same music not as, at all. <laughs> you know, I could go on and on. So you, you've kind of done the same thing. That's a hard thing to achieve for people to accept you. Well, he can do the, the funny stuff and he can do, you know, that and he can do that and he can do that. I think there is now like a, a rock and roll aspect of my work that people recognize. And that's that attitude is part of why mm -hmm. people turn to me for certain movies, I think. The funny thing is I've, I've always been pigeonholed in, in some genre. So when I was starting out, you know, told you I did the bebop score that Blue Note put out. Yeah. And my band Pet had, was 
right after that, went out on the Warp Tour to support the release of our album. And I came back from that tour and my friend, Adam Rifkin, called up and said, dude, we're doing a Kiss movie. And I'm like, what? Detroit Rock City. So he basically hired me for the gig on the phone. And then I found out two days later, I wasn't doing the movie because the producers thought I was a jazz guy and not a rock guy. <laughs> But that, I just got off a rock tour. Yeah, but yeah. That you got nailed. And then, you, yeah, know. you got nailed. So then I was doing, I guess, urban movies, right? And so then that I was that guy. Dance movies and then oh, wow. action comedy movies. And finally, a uh, music supervisor by the name of G. Mark Roswell was working with me on a Mario Van Peebles movie called Badass, which is the essentially the story of Mario's dad. Oh, wow. Melvin. Wow. And it was, it was a no budget movie, you know, for sure. But it was so fun working on that movie and a great musical experience, pretty much like Beck's band and I recorded it once it was written and a few other, my friends playing percussion and stuff. And so, uh, he liked the way I worked with Mario because Mario is a great guy, but he's high energy. You know, you gotta, you gotta really be able to spin a few plates at once with him. So it turned out great. Uh, I responded to a lot of challenges during the process. And he's like, you know, I'm doing Dawn of the Dead and I think you would be great for it. And I turned to him, I'm like, how am I gonna get Dawn of the Dead? I'm sure that that's a big universal movie. I don't have like a whole lot of- And they're, they're doing a repeat of a huge movie. Yeah, and it's like, you know, I don't have the orchestral repertoire. I mean, I can write, but yeah. I haven't had the opportunity. At yeah. that point, I hadn't really done any serious horror films, even though that's really what's in my heart. <laughs> so yeah. he advanced me a script and I wrote uh, a couple of pieces of music based on the script. And then he got me in the room eventually with Zack Snyder and I brought a CD in because I didn't, again, the, it had mostly avant-garde music on yeah. it that I pulled and some like Penderecki stuff, which was fresh back then in 2003. Uh, it's been mulled over uh, for 20 years now, but, um, so anyway, you know, I met with him and I knew I wasn't going to get the job. And I said, you know, if I were doing the score, I would do something like if Penderecki created a backdrop, an orchestral backdrop to an electronic, like hand played synthesized score. And he says, what is a Penderecki? And so then Eric Newman, like Randy Newman's son, right? Oh, wow. he was a producer on it, walks in at that very moment with a CD in his hand. He says, Penderecki, I have it right here. <laughs> he, says, he says, cause my dad told me last night if he were scoring this movie, he, or he were directing the movie, he would just use Penderecki's music. Cha-ching. So anyway, great meeting, didn't get hired. <laughs> I thought you did it. No, someone else, well, someone else was hired and then there was a snafu in the, the deal or something. So yeah. five weeks later, G Mark Roswell calls me back oh. and said, I think this movie is going to be your movie because this Zack Snyder really, really likes you. And so I had another meeting on it and That's, they, they uh, brought me on and I really owe a lot to, to, uh, to G Mark Roswell for believing in me. Cause he's stuck himself on, on the line. He put himself on the line for me. How do you, <laughs> cause it, the, the original soundtrack had a certain vibe and it was like almost like the personality of the movie. So how do you then take it and modernize it without stripping it completely? I mean, you know, was what was that process? I mean, right? You did you completely? What did? How did you think about it? I try not to think uh, about <laughs> about the original because it is such an iconic right. sound and score. So I just thought about what the movie needed, and luckily it had tested really poorly when they showed me a cut of it. And so going into Christmas is when they hired me, and I wrote a bunch of music, and they were testing the movie a few days after the Christmas break. So I had written a ton of music. Right. And then with my music editor, we took some of the avant-garde stuff I'd pulled, you know, for that CD I gave to Zach and we retemped the movie and I had a lot of music in there and it tested like 25 points higher. So I was like relieved and that, but I didn't really think of Get Carter as a remake because that was my first real remake, I think. What was Get Carter a remake? Of Get Carter, oh, uh, Get Car Stallone, oh. right? Okay, so I get this is cool. So you you just don't even think about the the other one. Well, You're just trying to like do what's right. How am I scoring a touchdown with this fucking team I'm with right now? Not yeah. 
I mean, I'm I not. Can't a, do it like I was doing it over there because this is a different team, different coaches, different everything. And then with 300, Zach called me up one day and says, "Hey, you know Frank Miller's 300." I'm like, "No, what is 300?" He yeah. says, "It's a graphic novel." He says, "Can you come over to my house? I want to show you. We're going to make a yeah. pitch to get this movie made, yeah. and I'd love you to do some demos for us, some music for puppets and drawings and stuff." So. Again, I didn't really want to go too deeply into the the history or the lore of like the fan base of the graphic novel because I think that would be polarizing for me. Mm, like, how right, do I right. make a strong choice about anything? Yeah. Um, same with Watchmen, which is like the holy grail of graphic novels. You know. Wow. Um, that's, and, that's a great. I didn't mention that. That's a. That's one of my favorites. Yeah, that was that was a lot of heavy lifting on that too, but as I've approached these these titles i just try and do something that's right for the movie something that the director will connect with whether they realize it or not you know just by trying to understand their sensibilities and um again like with the guardians movies i mean that was only a comic prior to then but i didn't want to make the typical music that you would expect in a superhero movie or right. marvel movie i wanted it to well, be you did, you did good with that that was cool that's so it was fun to do the first two of those movies i didn't do the new one but i did roller coasters on both coasts you know for yeah. disney so i've had a lot of guardians in my uh blood for a long time but yeah again i'm, I'm just looking mostly at how to tell an original right put an original spin on a story right. and they want i would imagine they'd want that they're doing a newer spin on it too mm -hmm. of and course then, so what you what's heavy lifting what was heavy lifting well uh, yeah well watchman is just a weighty film i mean it's just oh, yeah. the whole thing and it's very sophisticated and intellectually yep. and you have to apply that metric to the music with mm -hmm. it still feeling soulful because they're really that movie for me was a quest for soul among people yeah and it was really about what what manufacturing this catastrophic event that could yeah. in the wake of that bring people together it's kind of hoping that covid would have proved to be that but yeah i don't know so much that it did yeah although i had some fun tuesday nights at my my fire pit with a couple a couple of people who were in this similar uh similar yeah. covid you yeah. know protocol well, as me i was i was not at the pit that but i was here uh probably doing the same thing you were at the pit you know the first time i was here it was so awesome man it was you me george adrian and james lomenzo we rehearsed rehearsing because we played that elton john bit right. for james's birthday at the whiskey yeah, at the whiskey that wow. was so fun a funeral for a friend and love lies ble or your love lies bleeding right yeah yeah Whew. that was I was so happy Didn't with I us. Have to do Fred? Yeah, I know. I was so watch. happy with us. Yeah, that was. <laughs> I was scared to death. No kidding. Not, well, I had everything written out. You up front. You have to memorize. I had stuff written on like like four pages. Long. That's so. That's where I screw up every now and again. So George calls me, uh, day before we met here, uh, two days before, and he says, "Hey, have you done the homework?" I'm like, "What homework?" I was busy working on my day jobs. You like, know. Yeah. Is you know, for James's birthday, you know, the Elton John thing. I'm like, oh, yeah, I got to listen to that. He says, oh, bro, you are screwed. <laughs> you are screwed. He said, if you haven't listened to oh it, you are God. screwed. He says, I'll come over tonight and we'll, we'll work through it. Oh and God. so I was, I had to learn the whole funeral for a friend with my eyes closed. I'm like, there's so many modulations in that. I'll, I'll get lost if I think about what I'm supposed to play next. So I just had to feel Do you have a good memory? Do you have a pretty yeah. good Oh, see, I don't. Uh -huh. So we, uh, yeah, you know, that was the thing with Jerry Cantrell's tour. We had 46 songs in play, right? And when we first began rehearsing, I didn't know the music that went with the title for most, wait, 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 wait. most of the songs. The music, yeah. So everyone's got their charts and stuff, and, and they're wondering why I don't have any charts. Now, I'm not just playing rhythm guitar. I'm playing color lines on this section, yeah. these pedals, you know, dancing like Fred Astaire on the pedal board. <laughs> and then kicking into a rhythm then kicking into the lead of Jerry's singing. So it wasn't like a straight support gig. It was just constantly being all over the place and singing as well. So I just have to do it, you know, and I then feel the full rhythm of the sequence, you yeah. know, and oh, that's, yeah. and I committed to memory that way. And I, I'm, I'm but pretty they're good. Call, that way. They're calling out songs. And you're like, what song is that? Like the, you totally. Could, couldn't put the title. I know all the songs, but I don't know any of the titles. Well, fifteen. Well, yeah, fifteen minutes before you know, it sound before sound check. Jerry would be like, "Hey, what do we? Why don't we work this one up tonight?" And I'd be like, "I'm not sure about it." And he'd be like, "Then he'll play it on his phone." Oh, Meaning, yeah. 
we're going to sound check this in 15 minutes. So I'm like, all right, man. So that, oh that's God. how it went. It was fun, though. You know, God, to... I wish I had that kind of memory. You know who's like that? Uh, Billy Corgan with the pumpkins. I mean, photographic memory. I mean, he'd remember every cymbal crash. We play a song on this night, and two weeks later, we do it again. He'd look over at me if I didn't hit the cymbal crash. Like, what's wrong with you? No, he was a very sharp guy, Billy. Very sharp, man. You know. All right, so I got to ask you. I can't. I think I might have asked you this once. Well, how did you become a Titans fan? Because you grew up in Chicago <laughs> in L.A. I think uh, I asked you this. I okay. Yeah. This this probably goes back to you know why I can't sleep. Uh, <laughs> you know, I love my dad, but my dad is a definitely a different type person than me. Yeah. And I was you know living in California as a little kid. You know, I had toe headed kid really quiet I yeah. believe it or not and um my dad you know likes to drink and gambling and very loud and yeah. scary sometimes when yeah. I was a kid so the dolphins had their perfect season and he said see Ty you gotta love a fucking winner it's yeah. exactly what he said and I that's the the first thing I remember him ever saying to me in my life that I committed to memory I thought okay who's gonna be my team I'm looking at all the football teams and the standings because I wasn't really following football that yeah. closely yet. I was just a little kid. Yeah. So I'm like, Houston Oilers, one win and 13 losses, powder blue uniforms. That's my team. <laughs> that was just my way of saying, screw you, dad. Yeah. But then I was so invested in them. I I really became like a super fan of Elvin Bethay and Curly Culp. And, and uh, this is when they were Houston. Yeah, Dan Pastorini. And the running, and, running back. Uh, right. And so they had uh, Earl Campbell. Earl was, Campbell. And then they got Warren Moon. And then when they got Warren Moon, yeah. it was like a reinvestment in the team because I loved him. And then from him came Steve McNair and yeah. Eddie George. Oh, I was at that Super Bowl. Oh, that's another. Okay. That was horrible. At the one yard line. Uh, went, believe me. Yeah. Yeah. I was right there on the 50 yard line. It's like that defensive guy. It was for uh, St. Louis Rams, right? Mm -hmm. Held him. That was a miracle. Yeah. Held him. Kevin a, Dyson. Like a, an inch from the end zone. Yeah, it was horrible. Tragic. Yeah. And you had Eddie George, the greatest. And Mc, I mean, that was. I like, didn't cry. I thought I was going to cry. Um, I nearly cried when they lost uh, to the Bills after being up 35 to three in the oh. playoffs. I thought I was going to yeah. gonna cry then. But um, so what happened was they were displaced. And I'm like, again, they're such an underdog team. This is before the Super Bowl, right? So I, I migrated with them into Tennessee, and they finally got their their home in Nashville. And I just yeah. st stuck with them because I loved Steve McNair and Eddie George. Uh, sadly, Steve McNair died 14 years ago yesterday. Yeah. And uh, so I was out on the road at some. Oh, what happened was so the 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 Cardinals and the Steelers played the Super Bowl, and San Antonio Holmes had a pass thrown to him, and he didn't he didn't haul it in. And uh, mind you, he had some minor BS that year for smoking weed or something. Yeah. And I thought. It's just horse shit, really. So anyway, basically last opportunity for the Steelers. Uh, again, Roethlisberger throws the ball. San Antonio Holmes catches the winning touchdown. Weeks later, I'm at a Grammy party here in L.A. And my wife and I are at the bar with a couple of rock and roll manager friends of ours. And there's a ton of famous people there. And we're just having a drink, just having a good conversation. And someone from Warner's, Warner Brothers came up to me. And I was there because I scored you know, some movies yeah. that... Were, were, I guess, prominent over there. Yeah. The soundtracks were. So they're like, hey, Tyler, is there anyone here you want to meet? And I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. And I'm like, wait a second. Who's that guy in the windbreaker leaning against the wall over there by himself, right? They're like, oh, he's not in the business. He's a football player. That's San Antonio Holmes. I'm like, I want to meet him, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, and I hated the Steelers, man. Yeah. I have to say I hated them because they always used to kick the shit out of the well, Oilers. Yeah, if they were the AFC dominating. Yeah. They, they'd screw everybody. Oh, uh, my dad would bet on the Steelers yeah. and just punish me anytime yeah. that, that yeah. they would play. Anyway, I get the embarrassing intro because I'm like a film music guy at that point, yeah. you know, and they bring San Antonio over and they're like, San Antonio, this is Tyler Bates. He's a composer for movies. He did like Watchmen. He did 300. He says, you did 300? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, yeah. This is, <laughs> we rolled out every home game this year to 300. Dude, and as a matter of fact, during that Super Bowl, they played 300 like going into every, oh my God. every you, break, right? You every, scored a touchdown. Right. So we start talking and, and I'm like, God dang. I said, I should write a theme for the Titans. He's like, Titans? I'm like, come on, man. They're my team. Yeah, yeah. He says, you want to write a theme for the Steelers? I'll hook you up. I'm like, 
I'm so happy for you, but I'm not writing a thing for the Steelers. <laughs> the Steelers. I have a lot of childhood anguish associated with the Steelers, but I am really happy for you, man. And we talked for like 25 minutes. He was super cool. Was great. So then, you know, like I'm on the road like a year or two later and I'm bored, you know, because I'm used to doing stuff all the time. Yeah, I yeah. write music all the time. Yeah. And if you're in a bus or something, it's just boring. So I call my agent. I'm like, hey, can you find somebody in like on the Titans, like someone from marketing or somebody? I want to write a theme for them. And so I got a call like two months later from somebody who was in the marketing department. He said, hey, Tyler, we're big fans of yours here at the Titans, which is weird yeah. already. It's right like there, yeah. how you even know I exist is yeah. too, too crazy. So um, he said, so we understand that you'd be interested in writing a theme for the Titans. I'm like, yeah, I'd really love to write a theme for them. And so I wrote a theme and he called me back. He said, yeah, I played it for the guys. They love it. So we're going to go with your theme. And and uh, I did like a bunch of third and fourth down bits for them too. And so he calls me back and this is, this is pretty scary. He says, so Tyler, we understand you're an accomplished guitarist. And uh, I'm like, it depends who, you, <laughs> who you're talking to. But um, yeah. And he said, we'd love for you to come down and play our national anthem. I knew you were going to say that. And I'm like, it. oh my God. Oh, it's like a bell ringing in my head it goes ding. And I knew I could not unring that bell. If I said no, I would regret that for the rest of my life. Hey, at least you didn't have to sing it. Uh, hold on. Oh, no. Hold on. No, no, I didn't sing it. Believe me. Yeah. So anyway, I'm like, oh, shit, I got to do this. I got to do this. And I figured, OK, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to play it in the key it was written, which is F major, which is a terrible guitar key. Oh, yeah, right, because you're a step above yeah. E. Yeah, I didn't. Or a half I didn't step. use a whammy it's bar, a none of it. So my friend Michael Ciravolo at Schechter Guitars made a, a Tennessee Titans Telecaster body guitar for me. Um, I go down there. Oh, two weeks before I go down there, I meet this guy who is an associate of Adrian Ballou, who lives in yeah. Nashville. Adrian's one yeah, of the Adrian's genius. Yeah, genius guitarist. And so I met this guy and then I brought him out with my buddy George and I one night. We were playing a pro jam at Lucky Strike. I figured this guy's in his hotel room. Let's, you know, show him some hospitality here. And so, you know, we, we got pretty lit. And so he's like, Man, Adrian's a huge fan of your film work. I'm like, shut the fuck oh. up. You can't say that to me. <laughs> because he was like one of my idols when yeah, I was a no kid, kid, man. Uh, so anyway, he's like, yeah, he's going to come to the Titans game uh, when you play the anthem. I'm like, now I'm going to kill myself. So it turns out we all had There's dinner. There's no guitar players in Nashville, so what do you got to worry about? Yeah, I wasn't even thinking about the other four million of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, so anyway, so Adrian comes out to dinner with us the night before, and then I get him a ticket to our box. Like, and so before the game, I took my guitar up to this huge platform stage on one end zone, and there's a Marshall half stack, and I plugged in, and I just checked the sound. And it's one of those kind of cold, drizzly days, yeah. you know? So I'm like, okay, amp works, fine. I didn't even do a run through. I wasn't allowed to make too much noise or anything. Right, so right. I'm like, okay, there's sound. So I put the guitar down. The guitar's just sitting there. And so Adrian shows up at eight minutes to, to noon. And then some people come in, take some photos with me. And then someone from the, the stadium came in and said, Tyler, are you ready? And I'm like, oh, shoot. You know, I'm jumping out of the plane now. Oh my God. So a couple of my buddies oh, who were gosh. with me, they walk up there with me. And I pick up the guitar. It's really cold. And I retuned it. And before I get a chance for a mental rep, I hit standby on the amp and I'm like, Ch -ch -ch. that was it. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please welcome Hollywood <laughs> composer and Tennessee Titan <laughs> super fan, Tyler Knight. And I'm like, oh shit, here it goes. And I'm like, nah, nah, nah. And I open my eyes and I'm looking at the jumbotron of the other end zone and I'm like, size of Godzilla. I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So I close my <laughs> eyes. <laughs> open my eyes again it's the team like this and, and they're all huge and I'm like, oh shit you start crying oh no no i'm just thinking this is too significant and then i did it a third time and this military's like this i'm like oh my god i hope i don't totally screw this up and then i'm thinking adrian blue's watching this and my friends are right there they're yeah. you know it was just insane so i got through it they blew off all the fireworks i yeah. felt pretty good about it you know i survived when i get back adrian gives me a big hug he says man i could never do that He's i was right. too he scared couldn't. I'd be too scared to do that, but that's so heavy. That was like, oh my God, do I want to do it again? Hell no. One and done. I was going to ask you, is there something you haven't done that's bizarre like that, that you'd like to do? Well, maybe you didn't like to do it, but I'd say that's pretty unique and bizarre. And that's 
So, uh, that's a, that's amazing. That was fun. It, it was fun, but you know, it's just one of those things. <laughs> That's you, a, that's, you, you can't avoid it, right? No, you have to do you it. You can't avoid it. And I'm sure, especially with the the number of amazing artists you've worked with, you've been challenged to work with some people. You're like, oh, my God, you man. You can't say no, though. You can't say no, no but you but, know that you're going to have to give 140% oh, to, yeah. to survive that gig. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, man, that, that, that's a great last story because it's football, of course. And it's, um, I, I you know, I'm thinking... Uh, just an idea came ahead. I'm going to tell Jim Ursay that I want to write uh, a theme song for the Colts, and and I want to hire you to do it with me. The, the only problem is it's your enemy in another AFC. <laughs> but couldn't we do like a rivalry, like you and me, and like have a face off at one of their games? Come on, you're friends with the owner. I can do that. You I could do like we, Battle of the Bands. Are, you, are, are we going to do this in uniform or are we going to do this in mid-service? Oh, yeah, I'll do it in uniform. <laughs> All right, man. We'll it. get the horseshoe. We'll get the Tennessee Titans. All right. I'm into it. All right. In in Indianapolis. Well, it has to be because that's yeah, where the owner know, lives. And so. he'll send the jet to get us. All right. I'll convince him. I'll be seeing him in a couple of weeks. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> Battle of the Bands. <laughs> yeah, I love it. We're on it. All right. Hey man, thanks for coming, Tyler. I I mean I just can't wait to come to the next party of at your place and I love when you have all those dancing girls. Just for me, it's just, it just works out great. But thank you. Try to make everyone happy, Kenny. Yeah, thank you. You got all right, well, you made me happy today, man. All right. Awesome story, bro. Bye.